But um, I, I wanted just to pick up, we've had two powerful Sunday mornings with, with, with Mike just recently as he's been um, sharing on generosity. And it's been really quite amazing to see the presence of God come on these messages. Remember the first time, those that were humble enough to admit their need, the, the, the church, all of you, just felt God's heart to give. And it was beautiful. It was just so exciting to see God's such a heart for people who are struggling. And he has such a heart. And so many of you felt it and sowed into that. And then the last Sunday Mike was here, he um, ended up by letting us realize that God sees what's done in secret. Isn't it beautiful? Is he had words of knowledge for those who in secret had sacrificially given. And he just wanted to honor them because he saw that. And I think that's really, really precious. And I believe God's on this generosity. He really wants us as a church to, to grow and to change in this area. And um, I wanted to, to go beyond financial giving. I believe the Lord wants us to give of ourselves, our resources, our home, our time, just us. Because we've all got us to give. We don't always have resources. But God is, is stretching us out beyond where we've, we've gone before, out of our comfort zone. And also, we're not under law, which is the precious thing. We've all realized that it's nothing to do with rules. It's nothing to do with your have to's and your got to and, and uh, external stuff. It's all about the love of the Spirit. And the Spirit of God is so liberal, so generous, so spontaneous, so much joy in it. And it's this level of giving that God is wanting us to grow and enlarge in because he just is like that. And we're spirit people. And this is, uh, it's nothing like the Old Testament stuff that's putting us under law. It's just giving more room for the life of God within to flow out of us and go to places we've probably never gone before, a little bit deeper, a little bit further. So I want to share from Luke 10 on the um, Good Samaritan. And uh, this is in the context we've been praying for the harvest, haven't we? We've had prayer meetings, believing it's harvest time. And in Luke chapter 10, it starts off in the context where Jesus had sent out the 70. Now, first of all, Jesus had the 12. And then he sent out the 70. Because he said the harvest is there. This, you know, the harvest is great. There's not enough laborers. And uh, then the 70 came back, and they were excited. They were on a buzz. They were carrying the power of God. They said, oh, yeah, even the demons are subject to us. And it's just so exciting. And he said, yeah, but don't forget, the most important thing is your salvation. The most important thing is not the power kick and moving in the highs, it's actually that you're saved and your names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's the most important thing to remember. And then I said, he said to them, I want you to realize that I'm letting you see things that other people don't see. It says in, um, in verse 17, they came back with joy and he reminded them about the most important thing. And then he says in verse um, uh, tw uh, 24, he said, lots of prophets and kings have desired to see things which you see, and they don't see them. Hear things which you hear, and they haven't heard them. Because they're going to see things with the eyes of the Spirit. And this is the dimension of seeing. God's really bringing us into in a greater measure. And uh, then, he, then, because it was a religious man, stood up and asked him questions. I love the way when Jesus handles questions. Because this man actually wasn't a genuine seeker. He was a religious man. And he starts off in verse um, 25. A certain lawyer stood up. And he was just tempting him, saying, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I can tell he's a religious man because they're all about doing. What do I have to do? Tell me what I've got to do. And I'll do that and then I'll be right. That's what religious people, it's all about doing. But we're not under the law, thank goodness. It's all about receiving and delighting in what Jesus Christ has done. But anyway, he said, what do I do? And, 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 he, and he, said, what is, he said, well, you know the law. What does the law say? He didn't even refer to his own book. He said, okay, I've got to love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, and all my mind, and my neighbor is myself. He said, right. He answered, right, just live by the law. <laughs> you said it, you do it. Then he wanted to justify himself. Again, not a genuine question. He actually wanted to maintain status quo, just let everybody know that he was fine. Thank you very much. So he said, um, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> and then Jesus just gets a statement like that, and he gives a really good story. And there's so much in the parables. Parables can be 
take in so many ways and give so many insights. So we'll just read this parable. And Jesus, answering him, said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem is the highest place. It's where the temple was. It kind of speaks to us of where the presence of God is. To Jericho, which I believe is the lowest city on earth. It's really, really low down a dangerous road, which some of our people going to Israel might get to see. <laughs> but anyway, they went down to this low place. And they fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. These two religious characters were probably on their way home from doing their religious duties in the temples in Jerusalem, on the way back to probably where they lived. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host and said to him, Take care of him, and whatsoever you spend more, when I come again, I'll repay you. Now he turned the question around from who is my neighbor to basically who is being a neighbor. <laughs> Quite different. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to him that fell among thieves? And he said, he didn't even want to say the names. He hated the Samaritans. He wouldn't even use their names. So he just said, well, I think those people that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said, go and do likewise. So, um, yeah, the main thing, well, several things I want to bring up, up, but I've got limited time, but the first thing I want to draw your attention to from this certain Samaritan, the one thing that made a big difference is compassion. He was moved with compassion. Now, the natural man, the unsaved man, the man that hasn't been touched by God, is actually naturally very selfish and very self-centered. But we are not natural people now because we have been filled with the Spirit of God. If you're a believer, God has put his Spirit in you. And that gives us the heart of God inside us. And compassion is different in that your heart gets moved. Your heart gets stirred. Your heart gets poured out to the point of wanting to do something. And it's only because we've got the heart of Christ within us. We can't be like this unless we're filled and functioning and got the love of God in us. So the question is, um, one is, how do you know this is God's heart? I love it in, in Exodus when Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. And you think he's going to show him all sorts of wonderful things. And you know what he, he said? He said, I'll make my goodness pass before you. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. And the Lord passed by him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. This is what God's like. Do you know this is what God's like? Some people have never actually met a God like this. They don't know that God is full of compassion, full of love, cares about your state, and really, really wants to help you. Because that is the heart of our God. And, um, and, and now, how can I grow in this compassion? Because he's full of compassion, and I want to grow and become more like him. I'll just give you three little keys. One is, to grow in compassion, it's a principle in life that says, what you focus on, what you really get consumed by, what you really give yourself to, you become like. You know, that's how it is. So, there's a good verse in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, beholding him. That means with the eyes of our spirit man, if we gaze upon the Lord, if we really see what he's like, if we look at him and uh, understand his nature, if we dwell upon him, in the secret place, maybe when it's just you and God, just meditate on how he really is. He's such a loving, loving God who's cared about you so much. And, uh, and just give yourself to, to, to beholding him, to seeing him, looking through the eyes of your spirit and seeing what he is like as a spirit being. If you're not very good at seeing things, well, there's plenty of scriptures which describe him. 
I'd, I'd meditate on Luke 15, on, on the father of the prodigal son. That is such a beautiful picture of what God's heart is really like. When the prodigal son came home, he was a father that was yearning for him, longing for him, didn't even want to know all the things he had got into. He was far more concerned in having him back in his family and having him home, being a son, being a father again. That's the heart of our father. That's what he's really like. And if we meditate on scriptures, we can see him so clearly. And that's one way we can behold him. Another one is Matthew 18, the unmerciful person who was forgiven a huge debt, just like we are, forgiven a huge debt we could never repay. And then he wouldn't show mercy to someone else who had a small debt. And God was so angry at that. He lost his forgiveness because God's heart is so opposite to that. He's so full of mercy. And he forgives us huge debts. And he wants us to have the same, same way. So that's one way we can grow in compassion is to behold him. We'll become like him. That verse says, as you look at him and gaze upon him, and dwell upon what he's like, you'll actually become like him. And it'll be done by the Spirit of the Lord. You won't even have to work at it. The Spirit of God within us changes us, and it uses that word transformation, which is the same word a butterfly, when it goes through from a, a caterpillar to a butterfly, it just internally gets rearranged and becomes a different creature. And that actually happens inside us the more we but gaze upon and see what God is like read about it, see him, and just, just focus on it. And then the second thing is just to thank him. Thank him. We had a great message last Sunday night. Our person's life can be changed by focusing and being grateful, totally being grateful. Thank you, Lord, that you found me when I was bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road, when I was in lost and in need of, of, of a saviour, when I was in a state where I'd come down from that God had designed me to be and it was on my way down to a low place. That you found me and you didn't leave me there. You didn't even condemn me. You didn't even tell me all the things I'd done wrong and how angry you were with me. You just found me and you drew near to me and you loved me and you picked me up and you nurtured me into life. And if you become grateful, just becoming grateful for what um, the Lord has done to you, that's another way of becoming more and more compassionate. And the thirdly, when you hear him, I want you to move, like to give into that offering. When you hear him, obey. Just do it. Just keep doing it. The more you hear him, obey. And as you keep doing it, it'll become part of your nature. At first, it might be a bit of a struggle. You have all those questions. Can I, can I afford it? Just do it. <laughs> and I'll tell you, compassion will grow in your life. And um, it's just beautiful to know that the heart of the Father is like that. And I, I've, I've felt that. I've, I've been asking God for it. I remember there's one beautiful person in the church today. And I was, I've been trying to focus on the community. And, and this person came, and I came across her during the day. And I just felt God's compassion for her. I just felt I wanted to go and do something to help. God puts it in your heart. And all you want to do is to, to do it because God gives you that thing. I mean, there are lots and lots of needs around Jesus when he ministered. And he didn't meet all of them. But some of them, when the Lord puts it on your heart, you just obey. Just move. Do whatever you feel the Lord gives you to do. Because he has compassion. And that's how we can grow in it. Now, when you look at a parable, parables are great because you can look at them different ways. The first way I want to look at this parable is with Jesus being the Good Samaritan. You know, Jesus is exactly like the Good Samaritan. We are the person in need. So today I believe there's some here and you'll identify with the person in need. You're just, life is ebbing out of you and you're in a place where you're in need for a touch from, the, from, from Jesus. And Jesus is a wonderful good Samaritan. He made the journey from heaven to earth. It is so amazing that he would come from the realm of glory to earth. And what propelled him? Why did he do it? It was love. It was love for God so loved. He sent Jesus. He sent Jesus because he didn't want to leave man in the state of separation from God, brokenness, stripped of the glory that God intended us to carry. 
He couldn't leave man there. He had to come on that journey. And he had to find us. He wanted to find us. He wants to find you. He wants to meet with you. And he's able to pour in, in here, the Good Samaritan poured in the oil. Oil is for cleansing. But he was able to cleanse you with his precious blood. He can pour his precious blood over your sin today. He poured in the oil, which is healing and anointing. And he wants to pour that into your life. He wants a personal touch. Actually wants you to meet the person who's full of compassion and love. He wants to touch you. Some people know all about him. All they've met is religious people. They've never met a loving God. Never met a God who's full of compassion. Never met a God that's not going to judge them and be hard on them and angry with them. They just don't know this kind of God. But this parable demonstrates that he is that kind of God. And he wants to pick you up today and pour in his love and his healing. It seems to me he puts it on his, on his beast. And Daniel, all the different beasts that came up were kingdoms. I believe he's going to bring you into his kingdom. Because the minute you respond to his provision, you respond to him, you become part of his kingdom. And then he takes you to the inn, which is his family, to become part of and nurtured into life. So the, that way of looking at the parable is so beautiful. And I believe there's going to be some here, and I'll give you an opportunity at the end to respond because you're the person really lying on the Jericho Road that needs Jesus to touch you today. But the other one I want to touch on is looking at it because I believe God is speaking to me and speaking to the church because he is going to send us to do stuff like Lisa's been doing. He wants us penetrating this community. He wants us to go beyond the walls of the church and penetrate Hastings, Hawke's Bay, community. He's on this. He really is on this. And the Bible says, who is our neighbor? It's, it's anyone who's in need, who's, who's on my pathway, and I've got resources to help. And you know, he wants us to re-present Jesus. He wants us to be like Jesus. He actually wants us to be his arms and his feet and his hands and his voice in this community. What Jesus did, he's now sending us to do. He sent the 12, he sent the 70. Now, the Great Commission is for all of us to go and to represent and let the community know what the heart of Jesus is like. And it's, a, um, it's, it's going to be, um, I, I loved it too in, in verse, it says here, and on verse 34, he went to him. That's what I believe God is going to do a lot more of. We're going to go to where they are. There's a lot of come to us, come to us, come to our meetings, come to this. But we're going to want a lot more go to them. Go to where the people are. Go to where the needs are. Go to them because God is unleashing us. <laughs> God is sending us. He sent me. And I'm loving it. It's great. It's exciting. But it's scary. But it's fun. <laughs> and I believe God is urging us to take God's love and supplies to hurting people. That's why you responded the other Sunday. It's in your heart because the Spirit of God is in you. And he's wanting us to bring his love to hurting people in this community. And he wants us to be generous with ourselves, with us, with our lives, our resources, our heart, and we're going to be led by the Spirit as we do it. And, um, and Jesus had compassion on so many different groups of people. He had compassion on the sick. He had compassion on sheep without a shepherd, people that were lost, they had nobody to guide them. He had compassion on a widow who, whose, whose only source of income was, had gone and and he had compassion. He moved on that woman who was struggling. He had compassion on a, a, on a gadarene that was full of demons. He had compassion on all different types of people. And, he, and the 5,000 hungry people, he had compassion on them. And he was always moved with his heart on a whole range of things to do something. And he's going to put that com same compassion on, in us if we respond to it and grow in it. We'll have compassion. And we'll be a sense of urgency to, to go and to just do what we've got in our hands to do. Often it's not very much. Often it's just a bit of food or a ride or a, a friendly word or some act of kindness. But um, 
You know, you also see someone at school that's got no friends. They just need someone to befriend them. Maybe someone from another country. It's just so easy. Like the Friday before last, I took our Chinese guest to have lunch in town. And another lovely lady who was here today came to serve us. It was so exciting. I just said, do you go to church? you like to come to our church? She said, I'm a Christian and I'm from another country. And I thought, it's so exciting. I thought, come, come with us. Come home for lunch. And that's all it takes, just showing friendship, inviting them into your world. And um, so the questions I just ask us, are you willing to step into deeper water in this area? Are you going to go where the needs are? And uh, using the life of God, go right into the community. And, and this is just ordinary people, just us, ordinary people with God's heart. It's not going to be the pastors or the leaders or anybody special, just you with God's heart. Are you willing to really connect with hurting people? Because he's taking us where we've never been before and he's drawing us out of our comfort zone. And he actually wants us to present ourselves. The Bible says in Romans 12, present yourself as a living sacrifice. In other words, you, your life, who you are, make it available to God. And, and that's the call. I think it's a real call for us as a church. And then just quickly, I want to talk about innkeepers because I believe this is also part of what God is wanting to grow us in. The innkeepers, where this person was taken to, is God's people, church, small group, where God's family are gathered. And, you know, this is an entrustment. This good Samaritan brought this man that he had touched to the inn to be nurtured, for the process to continue, for, for growth, for, for um, ministry of healing to continue to take place. And we are innkeepers. Bay City is an inn. And I want us to be the best innkeepers in town. You know, I want us to go beyond, and we are friendly. We are lovely people. We very nicely shake hands and say, how do you do? But I want us to go deeper. I really want us to go another step. I want us to exchange phone numbers with them. I want us to say, look, we're off to the beach. Come to the beach with us. We're going to the park for lunch. Come to the park with us. If their kids look like they're lost, help their kids find friends. Come and have coffee with us. I want to get to know you. It's actually going a little bit deeper. It's properly assimilating them. So we're purposefully forming long-term friendships with them. And this is going to take a little bit more of us. We can't leave it to the First Connection team because we can't do it. I went to a church recently and it's the culture of the church. The whole church has been trained to properly befriend and assimilate and form purposeful friendships with new people that are coming. And I believe God's really on us to grow in this area. Do you know, I'll just give you a couple of facts, uh, we had 230 new visitors come to this church recently. 78 of them returned their forms, and 20 of them started the equipping trip. Wow. I dare say some would have been from other places and that, but I believe if we make a more effort to actually befriend them, and even have this man put him on his own horse, you might have to use your own car. <laughs> you might have to share more of your resources, but I believe God is going to require more of us to properly form meaningful friendships with the people that he's entrusting us with. I believe he's going to bring them in and they're precious. You know, they're precious to God and it's an entrustment for us as a church. And I'm just calling you, as a mum in the church, to rise up and go a little bit further in our connection with new people. We need the whole church to open up our hearts, our homes, our resources, our families, to make people really feel that they have a sense of belonging. You know, one lady from our church went to another church recently. She had three people invite me for lunch. Yay! She felt so buzzed. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great if three people and one visitor wanted to get to know her more? I just, I believe we can just go further. So I haven't got any more time. I'm going to have to stop. But I believe the challenge as a whole church is for us to be willing to go further into the community. See a need and meet it, basically. And if God draws your attention to a need, just get close enough to see. And I believe when you get close enough to see, 
the heart of compassion, God's heart in you will be moved. And you'll see them through God's eyes. You'll see them as people that God loves, made in his image. And the enemies come in. Thieves have come and robbed them. They've been exploited. They've lost their, maybe their relationships, lost their money, lost their homes, lost things that are precious to them. They've been exploited and they've been left in a, in a state where God doesn't want to leave them. He wants you to pick them up and to nurture them back into life. He wants us to go right in all around the community. And as we're doing our daily, just as we're journeying, just as we're journeying, it's, Lord, today, lead me to someone today that I can share life with, that I can share your heart with. Use me today, Lord. Use me today. I just want us all to be willing to, to go a little bit deeper in the community. And secondly, anybody that comes in here, see it as an entrustment. God's bringing precious people in. Be prepared to go deeper with them. Be prepared to you know, have, have a little bit more time with them, get to know them. Be part of the process, because we can't do it on our own, you know. God wants us to use others in the process. I'm so pleased that the two people I've just met recently, I didn't even have to bring them to church today. I rung both of them. They already had a ride. You know, the, the body's already sharing the load. And, that's, and I need that, because I won't be here the next three Sundays. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, can, we can share with one another the load. But God wants us as a body to become a most hospitable place where people are befriended. And before I finish, if you're that person and you really feel like you're in need of a touch from the good, Samar the good um, Samaritan today, God wants to touch you. He knows, I believe there's at least three here today, and you're like the person who's just been left with life flowing out of you, and you need a personal touch from a compassionate, loving God who has the resources to pour his grace and mercy into you. So maybe you can just stand and sing, Suze. Time's gone very quickly, but I would do want to pray for those people who would feel they need the, 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 the great, compassionate, merciful God to pour his life into you today. Maybe you've never had that touch from the Lord before. Maybe it's the first time you realize that Jesus has come all the way to help you find life because he doesn't want to leave you in a place of brokenness. He's come all the way from heaven and earth, Jesus himself, to bring life and reconciliation and wholeness to us. So if you're in that category, I'd love you to come forward as we sing this song and we'll pray for you. Pray that the life of God, the grace of God, the oil of God, the healing of God will touch you today and then we can continue to uh, get to know you and nurture into life. Bless you, brother. I believe there's three. Three that need Jesus. So maybe we can all stand up. And if you just need Jesus, he is full of compassion. He does not condemn you. He doesn't even want to know all the wrong things you've done. He's more interested in restoring you. He's more interested in bringing his life and healing. He just wants you to come home. He wants to wrap his arms around you and say, my son, my daughter, welcome home. Welcome home. Do come. Jesus is the Good Samaritan. Came from heaven to earth. Bless you. Just maybe come and stand as a group. Can you in front of me? I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Lead you in a prayer to open your heart to Jesus. Open your heart to Jesus. Great to have you here today. Welcome. 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 Now let's all just pray. Welcome. Welcome. Lord, we're just going to lead these people in a prayer today. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have seen my state. I thank you that you sent Jesus to save me. I open my heart today to you, Jesus. I receive the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. I receive the oil to bring healing and anointing to my life. I receive you into my heart. And I thank you that you love me so much. I praise you and I thank you that you found me and you brought me to this place today. In Jesus' name. Love is here today to touch and to restore these lives. 
Lord, I release your healing. I thank you, Lord, and when we come to you, you're full of compassion, you're full of love, you're full of mercy. You don't turn us away. Lord, you pour in your love. And we can meet you today. We can receive you today. We can receive your love and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, we can become part of your family. And we thank you that you didn't leave us there. You came and you met us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There are people here today that would love to meet you a little bit further. Maybe take you and just have a few minutes to talk to you. And uh, the rest of you, I just want you to face the challenge to go deeper, to go further. And as a church, let us become a great inn. There are several that have been going to pray for today that are going to go and leave and go to other places. If you'd like to come forward now and ministry uh, team would love to pray and bless you as you go.